record audio. That was near record. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Today we're lucky to um, have um, Jamie Steele from Pacific Technologies presenting. Um, Pacific Technologies are a leading global third party developer. Um, and they provide innovative solutions where the Sage 300 products can't fill the gaps. Uh, we've worked with them a lot over the years and we're, they're a very trusted third party um, supplier to us. Um, so we're really excited today to get them to show you their purchasing workflow suite. And um, at the end of it, you'll be able to either um, address you know, any questions to myself and I can either direct them to Jamie um, or we can work out how you'd like to proceed if you're interested in any of these products. So I'm just going to hand over to Jamie um, and I'm sure he'll probably let you know how it'll go and he might open it up for questions at the end, um, but I'll let him go from there. Okay, very good. All right, yeah, so thanks very much for that, Stacey. So, yeah, so my name's Jamie Steele. I'm the Business Development Manager for Pacific Technology Solutions. Um, and so, yeah, what we just want to go through today is um, some of our key workflow modules um, that we think might be of interest to you guys. Um, so, first of all, we'll look at the purchasing workflow suite. Um, and just a little bit of background here, Stacey's already touched on some of it, but we, we work only with Say 300 and we've been, we've been an ISV for Say 300 for over 20 years. Um, so we, we do our development using the Sage 300 software development kit or SDK. And so that means our modules look and feel like Sage 300 and they're all sitting inside the Sage 300 database. Um, so what that, one of the benefits of that is that it, it makes it quite easy for you as customers to be able to learn the modules and to be able to look after them yourselves. Um, so, uh, yeah, so our head office is in New Zealand um, and we've also got offices and we do hosting as well, so in, in Toronto and in Melbourne. Um, so, just moving along to this next diagram, this shows our three different workflow modules. So on the left hand side is the purchasing workflow module. So that's the whole purchase requisitioning process. That someone does a requisition, goes through the approval process and creates a purchase order. Um, and then below that you can see workflow documents. So this module lets you attach external files to your requisitions. So if, if you want your staff to get, say, three quotes, so if the requisition's over $10,000, you might have a rule that you have to have three quotes from three different suppliers. <clears throat> and one could be Word, one could be Excel, and one could be uh, PDF. And so with workflow documents, you can attach those files to your um, transaction, and it saves those within the Sage database. Right, so that's purchasing workflows, the first one. Then in the middle here is payables workflow, and this is the workflows on supplier invoices. And this is, seems to be an area in Australia, and I think New Zealand as well, maybe a little bit behind in terms, but in Australia seems to be sort of a real area that companies are really focusing on, is moving to a whole paperless accounts payable system. And so with our payables workflow and with workflow documents, that lets you have a paperless AP. And so we'll show that one to you today as well. And then on the right hand side is our third workflow module, which is called workflow and notifications. And we won't really have time to look at that one today, but just to make you aware of it is <clears throat> workflow notifications provides workflows in over 20 different parts of say 300. And so for example, vendor master files, you can have a workflow, customer master files, general ledger account codes, inventory items. So a lot of those master files, you can have a workflow. And also on some of your key transactions, so general ledger journal entries, AP payments, um, AR credit notes and IC adjustments can all have workflows. And what we're really sort of focusing on is what are the transactions or the different parts of say 300 where 
staff members can sort of carry out a fraud and cause those are sort of the areas that we want to put workflows in place. Right, so that's that's the third one. We've learned notifications, um, and I guess just the, probably the heck biggest area for that is vendor master files. So people changing the bank account number to their own bank account number, um, and then making a payment. So with workflow notifications, you can prevent that from happening. All right, so those are the workflow modules, and those are all available within the Sage desktop. But with a workflow solution, it's quite important to have a web um, uh, front end so that managers can do their approvals from a web browser. And so for that, we've got a, a connected service called PW Web, and I'll show that to you as well. So you can run your payables workflow just purely within say 300 or any of these purely within say 300 or you can have a web interface um, but that's that's an extra option if, for those companies that want it okay now this next slide is shows what we call the p2p business process so the procure to pay end-to-end -end business process so you can see in the six green boxes are the six main steps of the p2p process um, so setting up your vendor master files you end with your vendor catalogs some one does requisitions they go through an approval process create a purchase order um, then they can be received once the goods and services are supplied you can do a receipt then the invoice comes into your organization and then you pay that invoice so those are the sort of six main steps and you can see in this middle row these are the controls that our solutions put in place so we've got workflows on five of the six areas and the one that we don't have a workflow on is receiving so we can block over receiving um, so really I guess what we think is now the whole end-to-end -end procure to pay business process with say 300 and with our modules you can have controls across the whole process and then down the bottom there this just shows the different steps in the process where you can attach documents with the workflow documents module and so like I've said already you can attach quotes to your requisitions you can also attach quotes or any other documents for that matter they don't have to be quotes you can attach sort of any any documentation to purchase orders as well and then receiving slips so if your staff are doing receiving they can attach the, the receiving documentation to that transaction and then the last area is the invoice images all right so that's um, that side of it so now what we can do is we'll just sort of focus or drill down into the purchasing workflow suite itself and so there's a number of modules within the purchasing workflow suite that are, are required depending on the type of industry or what you you know the company is looking to achieve so in the green boxes of the say 300 modules so we've got general ledger accounts payable purchase orders We've also got project and job costing which some of you may be using um, and then inventory control which some of you may be using that as well so in terms of purchasing workflow so the core module is called purchasing workflow and that first there's a few different elements to that module first of all you can set up the workflow that meets your requirements for your controls <clears throat> and so within each workflow you can have many approval steps um, and then when a requisition has gone through all those approval steps then it will create the purchase order within the sage purchase order module so purchasing workflows it's really like a front end for the sage purchase order module um, but it's also got its own transaction entry screen and what we have tried to do with that screen is two things first of all we try to make it very easy for the users to use so that you don't have to be an accountant to use it um, and one example is that uh, and there's where it builds the general ledger codes for the users so if you set up purchasing workflow following a few rules then it will when the user picks a certain item then the system will build the GL code for them 
So that's the ease of use side of it, but then there's also a lot of security options. Um, so you can lock down certain fields um, if you want to do that as well. Right, so that's purchasing workflow, so you can just have that module on its own. Um, then beside that is workflow documents, we've already talked about that, so that's where you can attach your external files. Um, the vendor catalogue, that's if you have set buying prices from your vendors, or if you want to enforce approved vendors, um, then the vendor catalogue, so you can say, well, we'll let you do that. So you can say for a certain item, it can only be purchased from this one vendor or these two or three vendors. So you can set it up so the system will not allow that item to be purchased from any other vendor. Then we've got internal issues, um, that's if you're consuming inventory as part of your business instead of selling the inventory. So mining companies use internal issues heavily, um, some hotels also use it, um, so I won't spend too much time on that one. Um, and then on the left hand side is funds availability. So this is the real time general ledger budget checking facility. And so if if many of you have issues where you are exceeding your budgets, then funds availability should be able to help you to stop that sort of thing happening or reduce it quite a lot. Um, so when funds available, when someone's doing a requisition, the, the the users, the requisitioners can see the funds availability and so can the managers, but the system can also check the funds availability as part of the workflow. So if there's not enough budget, then this workflow engine can direct that requisition to someone in finance to, to review it. Right, and funds availability, it also works with it works with general ledger, but it also works with project and job costing. Um, so in both of those areas, it, it's quite a powerful solution. And then up above there is PW Web that we've already sort of talked about in terms of the web interface. Um, and so with PW Web, the, what a, it's a connected service. So what that means is that your Say 300 system is sitting wherever it's currently hosted, or it can be in your, on your own servers in your own offices or wherever it's located. And we've got software running on servers in Melbourne. And so if, when someone is, does a requisition through PW Web, they'll be connecting to the software running on our servers that then connects to your Say 300 system. And this is all connecting in real time using web services. And um, so it's really utilizing all the, the functionality on the Say 300 system, but it's just providing, providing a web portal access to that. Um, and but a really important thing, probably the most important thing, is that we do not store any financial or transactional data on our servers. So that data is, is on only one place, which is within your Say 300 system. All right, and this is an example of the email. We'll have a look at that once when we um, push some transactions through. Um, and we've probably covered some of this. One of the key benefits with PW Web is that it, it means you only need one saved land pack for every 50 requisitioners and approvers. So it can actually make it a much more cost effective approach rather than all the users having to connect into Sage. Um, and then we've got a few other slides here, which we can provide these through um, Stacey and the other uh, guys at Aptus if, if you want to see these, um, but we probably don't have time to go through them too much today. Um, and then just moving along. So in terms of purchasing workflow, so purchasing workflow has been, was first released in 2004, so it's about 15 years old now. Um, but so we've got over 850 customers that use purchasing workflow, so the software has been quite well proven and um, you know it's been run by some quite large businesses and we've had lots of 
you know, lots of the features that are in purchasing workflow have come from um, uh, suggestions from customers, and we've got yeah within Australia, you know, a lot of uh, really good customers within the, over there. All right, so now if we can just have a look at the software. So um, what we'll do is um, we'll do a transaction through PW Web to just show you how that works. So what I will do is we'll come to this login page. And so we, well, the first thing at the top here is it shows our logo, Pacific Tech PW Web. So if you proceeded with the solution, then that would have your logo at the top rather than our logo. And then we go on our drop down. So this shows us the companies from our Sage drop down list. And this user ID and this password, it can either be their Sage user ID or their Sage password. Ah, oh, sorry, sorry. Sage user ID and password, or the Windows uh, user ID and password. And so, when I click login, what PW Web is doing is connecting to the Sage system and saying, "Is that user ID valid? And is that password correct? And if it is, then it is reading the security rights of that user from the Sage security." settings. So you can see these menus here. Um, we've got transactions, so we've got two different transactions we can do. We've got some inquiry screens, um, so we can look up our requisitions, and we can look up our funds availability, and we'll come back to substitutions a bit later. But basically the menus, what is shown on these menus for this user is driven by the security within Sage. So yeah, I guess that's just another example of, you know, wherever we can, we utilise the Sage horsepower and, you know, we're just trying to add functionality to that. So if we come and do a new requisition, so we need to select the workflow that this transaction will be for. So I've got one called Simple, which is just a single approval step. Oh, I think it might be one or two approval steps. And then we need to select our department or our cost centre. So I'll choose marketing. Um, then the next field here is the template. So we don't have to use a template, but I've got one set up called conferences. And so uh, um, what this sort of shows you is, I guess, just another part of how we're trying to make it easy for the users. So by putting in a conference template, it's brought three lines onto the screen for us, airfares, accommodation and incidentals. So let's say we're going to a conference in Perth. Um, so here we've got our airfares. So Actually, so what you can see is it's, we've set up a default vendor. So a lot of these fields, you can have defaults, you know, if you want a default vendor to apply for this item, then you can set that up, but you don't have to set that up. So that's two airfares of $500 and then some accommodation. So we'll say, four nights accommodation. And this third line, what I'll do is I'll delete the line just to show you that, that it's fine to delete lines because quite a few companies say to us, you know, are you are you restricted because it's come from a template? And the answer is that no, you're not restricted in any way at all. So I'll delete that line and then now I'll come and add a new line. And what I'll do is just start typing in some characters. So I've just typed M-I-S and you can see that it, it narrows down <clears throat> the list of items just based on the characters that you type in. So again, you know, it's very easy for users from a user of usability point of view. So that's the item number and even if, if some of you might be in services organisations where you don't have any inventory and so what you can do is you, the system needs at least one item number so you could just set up one item called miscellaneous like I've got here um, or you can set up different items for different types of services that sort of thing. 
Um, and then we can override the description if we've got access to to do that. And then if we go on the vendor field, it's very much like the item field where we can just start typing some characters in and it narrows the list down. So this is showing us all of our vendors from accounts payable that are presented in this list as well. So I'll say $100 for taxis. And now with the workflow documents module, that provides this tab here. So this is where we can now come and attach some documents that we want to have attached to this transaction. So we select file to attach and then we can um, navigate to pick up a PDF. And then we can attach multiple documents as well if we want to. Um, and so now if we're happy with this requisition, we now submit it into the workflow. So we could just add the requisition so it saves in the mm -hmm. database and come back and make changes to it and then submit it. But in this case, I'm happy with it. So, I, I, so it's now going into the workflow engine that's determining who to send it to for an approval and it's sending out an email to that person as well. So you can see at the top there, it's requisition number 574. So what this person can do is they can come into their inquiries into my requisitions and if we change the status to unapproved then we can see our one number 574 at the top there and so we can just see the header information here but if, if we click on that uh, hyperlink it will then open up the requisition so we can see the D details there. But one other thing that what I would really want to show you in this screen is if you come into the events tab, you can see what we call the next actioner. So this is saying which person is this is this um, requisition sitting with for an approval. So it's it's we can now a requisition it can always see which manager it's the requisition sitting with. So this is someone called division manager. All right, so I'll log out of PW Web and I'll just come into our emails to just see whether this, so an email will get sent out quite quick, uh, I guess quite shortly to just say that this requisition, uh, sorry, this yeah requisition has been sent for an approval. So it might just take a minute to come through, so we'll probably come back and have a look at this. Um, Yes, yeah, so we'll come back to this shortly. Um, so yeah, so the, the person would have got the email. Oh, I can just show you one a previous one, I suppose would be good. Hmm. Wow, how guys have been doing a lot of testing. Here we go. So here was one that was done, a similar transaction, requisition 573. Um, so it's got the requisition number, the dollar value, and it's got the requisition attached as a PDF. So it's just the standard crystal report. And here is the hyperlink. So with the PW web, um, the manager can get this email, they can have the requisition attached, the quotes can be attached automatically, and they can now click on this URL and this will take them to the PW web login page and it pre-populates the user ID, so they just need to put in their password, and then click login. And so because this person is a manager, when we look under the approval console, you can see that we've got three menu options here. So we've got one for purchasing, which is 
the one that we come into, which is, so this is approving requisitions. The second one is approving supplier invoices, and we'll come to that a bit later on in the session. So here are the invoices that are sitting with this manager to be approved. And the third one is other approvals. So this is the workflow notifications module. So if there's some vendor master file changes or some general ledger journal entries, um, then they would be showing there. But if we come back to purchasing, we can see there's about eight transactions there and we can see our 1574 is at the bottom there. So the conference in Perth. So the Normally the first thing the managers want to do is sort of open that up and well, look at the details to see what that requisition is about. So we can see, okay, some two year fares and some accommodation and some taxis for hundred dollars. Then they quite often want to look at the attached documents so they can come here, they can open up the files and they just are opening up in the browser. So there's the quote. Um, and then the next thing is if, if you have the funds availability module then you can use this icon here to check the budgets. So if we click on that dollar icon, that's now sending a request back to the SAGE to purchasing workflow or funds availability running on SAGE server saying can you uh, crunch the numbers for this requisition and so it has done that and so you can see the two GL codes 6380 and 6540 so on this requisition there's two general ledger codes and for each of those general ledger codes if the system has worked out the budgets from the GL and the actuals from the GL and the commitments are the purchase orders that have been approved but haven't been received yet and so that then leaves a an available balance which is so that's just calculated as budget minus actual minus commitments as the available um, and then it also shows the value of this document and other unapproved so these are other requisitions that are coming through the approval process and that are not fully approved yet. So we're trying to sort of give all of this information to the manager um, so to help them make the decision whether they should approve this or not. Um, so this is actually not, a, hopefully this wouldn't be the case in any of your companies where uh, the, this, in this situation they're exceeding the budget by $182,000 which is not very good. Um, so I'm sure none of you guys have that situation. So, so what we could do here, um, so you can see this column where it's, it says pending. So if we want to approve a transaction, you click in this drop down and you change it to approve, or if you want to decline it, then you would change it to decline. Um, so what I'll do, I'll just leave 574 sitting there so I can show you something else. And what I'll do, well, I could just decline this one here and I, and you can type in it, you've got a 60 character comment as well. So you can say, um, yeah, this is, this is too expensive. And we can, we can approve two or three and decline, you know, two or three. And so once we've we've done those, then we can click this button, postmark documents, and that moves those transactions along to the next step in the workflow. So it takes them off this person's console and moves them to the next person in the approval process. And now, yes, yeah, so the approval console is now reduced by those two. Right. So what I'll do is I'll just log out of that because the other the next thing that I was wanting to show you is this, uh, that we've developed an app that runs on the different phones, well, on Apple phones and on um, Android phones. So, um, so I'm running this in a browser, but this is basically exactly what it looks like when it's on a phone. 
And so I should just clarify that a little bit. So with the app, this has been released on the Apple Store about two weeks ago. With the Androids, um, we are thinking it should be ready within about one to two weeks from now. So it will then be on the Google Play Store. So it's on Androids, it's not available right at this minute. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, so now if we log in as this manager. <coughs> um, so again, it's sort of querying the data from the Sage system <coughs> and presenting it <coughs> in this format here. So it shows the user they've got these different purchasing transactions. So six purchasing transactions to approve and seven invoices to approve. And so if we look in our requisitions, um, this now lists the three requisitions that we've got to approve. So we can see our one there, 574 at the bottom. And we can click on this arrow to now look at the detail. Uh, so now we can see the airfares and the accommodation and the taxis. And then here is the attached files. <clears throat> so we can click on that and that will now um, open that up on the phone just like any other app opens up a, a um, file on the phone. Right, so if we're happy with that, we can click on the tick. Um, so even though it's over the budget, let's say we're, for whatever reason, this is vital. and hit submit. So this is now sending the message back to the, the purchasing workflow on the SAGE system saying this transaction has been approved, move it along to the next step in the process. And then now this number of requisitions is reduced from three down to two. Right, so what we should do now is go and have a look in the SAGE desktop. And so this is our SAGE system that we're connected to. So if we come and look at purchasing workflow, um, you can see that it looks and feels just like uh, other SAGE modules. So when we're doing our development, we try and follow the SAGE standards as much as we can. So we've got a setup folder here. So this is where you do all the, the different parts of the setup. Um, and we won't go into this too much. Um, I guess a few key things, you set up your authority levels. This is where you put in all your delegated authorities in terms of how much the different uh, staff can approve up to. And then in, in here is the workflows. Um, so this is sort of the most, um, well, the key part of the system, I suppose. Um, and so this is the one I'm using, simple, so you can see it actually, it's got two approvals. So it went to the cost center manager, then it goes to the controller for a second approval. All right, and um, we can, we've got a facility to just draw a flow chart based off the workflow. So you can, you can when you're setting up the system, you can just check that the whole flow looks the way it should do. So I won't spend too much <clears throat> time on that, but what we can do is if we come to statistics inquiries and come to management inquiry, um, we can, this is really lets you look at all the requisitions across your organisation and you can filter it down so you can just do a certain cost centre or a certain originator or a certain status. But if we come to the bottom, we see number 574, and we can see in this column here, next actioner, it says controller. And so that means that that is sitting with that controller to do their approval. So that just happens to be who I'm logged in as. So we can now come and do this approval. So actually, let's slow down a little bit. So if we come into PW transactions, and then you can see these are the different transaction screens within the desktop. Um, and we come into the approval console. And so this is before we were looking at the approval console from PW Web. We're now looking at P the approval console with PW within the desktop. The functionality is basically the same between the two. Um, so we can double click and we can come and look at the attachments. 
we can come into the event logs, we can see who's already approved it and what their comments were. So that was the approval that was done on the um, on the app. And then we can look at the budget as well. The funds availability. And if we're happy, we'll approve that. And click post. And so now, <clears throat> because this is the second approval, which is the final approval for this workflow, you can see that purchasing workflow is now creating the purchase orders within this HPO module. If you just saw that little window that popped up, that was the, the window from within Sage when a PO is created. And the other thing that purchasing workflow is doing is emailing those purchase orders to You've got some different options as to who the purchase orders can be emailed to, but I think a lot of most companies have the purchase orders get emailed to the requisitioner so that they can just review them and then forward them on to the vendor. Um, so if we come back and look at our management inquiry now, if we come to rec to the bottom, we look at number 574, you can see it's now completed. So if we double click to open that up, we can come into the workflow events and this has now got some more entries added to it. So now the controller did their approval. And they, there was a comment they put in and because that was a final approval, it's now purchasing workflows created the purchase orders automatically. And we can see those if we come onto the requisition tab and if we come along in the grid, you can see the P, this column here, purchase order number. So because because each line was a different vendor, purchasing workflow then had to create three purchase orders. <clears throat> if all three lines were to the same vendor, then it would have created just a single purchase order. So it's created PO number 569, 570, 571. And I'll just come and show you those. If we come into the PO module, we'll just come and have a look at them in there just so you can see that they are in there. So there they are, 569 for the airfares, 570 for the accommodation and 571 for the taxis. All right, so those purchase orders have been created, they've been emailed to the requisitioner. You can, the system can email them straight out to the to the vendors um, and some companies do do that, but I think most companies prefer to just have someone within the company review them before they go out to the vendor. Right, so now the next thing is we can receive, do the receiving through the web as well. And I'll just show you that to you very quickly just so that you can, um, for some companies this might be useful, other companies they prefer to keep the receiving within the finance function. But now we come into transactions, we come to PO receipt and we can see our ones if we go to the next page. Unfortunately this the Sage sample data, oh there they are there. The Sage sample data is even from 10 or 15 years ago, they had it in the year 2020. So that's, if you're wondering why there's some transactions in 2020, that's because that's just the Sage sample data. So you can see our transactions here, 569, 570, 571 for the, the three um, POs relating to the conference. So if I come into 569, which is the year fares, I can say that um, I now receive these year fares. And now I click post. So this is now creating a PO receipt within Sage. And because that purchase order is fully, fully processed, it's now, um, the purchase order is now closed and so now drops off the list. And now, we can do the 570, which is the accommodation. So let's say we came back a day earlier. Um, so we want to do a partial receipt. So we can say we received three nights accommodation and we'll say it's completed. So that they will close the, um, 
the fourth line. So you can either do a partial receipt and leave the balance on back order, or you can do a partial receipt and close the balance. All right, and we can also attach files as well. So we can attach any documents that we want to um, at this stage, and those are all kept within the SAGE database. Right, so that's now creating the next PO receipt. Um, all right, so that is the, I guess now the invoice is the next step in the process. Um, so, and this is now handled by our payables workflow module. Um, so we can now come and look at that here. Um, so, within Powerless Workflow, you've got two types of transactions that you can put in. Um, um, so you, can, you can have an a, AP invoice or a purchase order invoice. Um, and so just Maybe, so, I don't know if I made it clear or not, but you can just put in payables workflow without purchasing workflow as well. So for some companies, like if some services organisations where if they're not using purchase orders, they might just be using accounts payable, then the, the payables workflow module can be valuable for those sorts of businesses as well. So let's say, first of all, if we come and put in a, an AP invoice entry, so I'll log in as, I'll log in as accounts payable. So if we come into our PA transactions, AP invoice entry, so the AP people, instead of entering invoices into the AP module, they would come into Payables Workflow. So I keep Payables Workflow as like a front end for the Sage AP module and the Sage PO module. Um, so we've put in our, inv we've got our invoice in front of us. So we enter in the invoice number and we can have an invoice for a credit note. We'll put on a vendor 1200. And now we need our workflow and our cost centre. Um, and once we get below the cost centre field, you can see all the other fields are very much the same as the Sage AP invoice entry screen. Um, so for the AP staff, it's, it's very quick and easy for them to learn this module. So now we're doing a direct AP invoice, so it's not related to a to a purchase order because I just want to, I think that's a good way to start. So I'll add this transaction. Now I'll come and attach my invoice image. Um, so I can, I can pick up a file if it's sitting on the network, but you can also copy and paste from an, from your email. So if you, I think a lot of you will have a mailbox called AP at whatever, at your company domain name. So with a lot of AP staff, they'll just enter the details in here and then copy the PDF and paste it into here. So you, you don't actually have to save it onto the network, you can just copy and paste. So now, so this is now the whole paperless AP. So because you've got your invoice in here, you don't need to keep any hard copies. So we now submit that. That goes, we can come into the event, workflow events, and we can see it's gone to the division manager. That person can do their approval through the web again. So now they come into the approval console, they come into supplier invoices. And we can see our invoice at the top there, 191112, so today's date, AP-I1. So again, they can open it up to look at the details, they can look at the invoice image. Here's the invoice image. Um, they Now, they can edit the GL coding if you want them to. So you can either allow that or you can block that. So that's one of the configuration decisions if you proceed with this module. And so this manager can approve it from here. They could also approve it from the app. Um,
And so this is now moving along to the next step in the workflow. And if we go back to our desktop, um, I just happen to know that that is the controller. So um, the controller comes into Purple's workflow and into the approval console. There it is there, so they'll approve that. And now, because that's the final approval for that invoice, it's now pushed it across to the accounts payable invoice batch list. So if we come and have a look in there, you can see there's a batch here with three entries and that batch is still open and it's got a PA source application. So PA means payables workflow. So if we open that up and look at the last entry, we'll see that it's our one, which is vendor 1200 and there's the invoice with today's date. So, so we can't change anything here because that would defeat the whole purpose of having an approval process. So the invoices just come across here into a batch and then every now and again, well, either daily or weekly, the AP person just comes and hits post. And that now push, oh, no. it pushes it through to General Ledger. Um, oh right, we've got our workflow notifications module running here, which is, um, I'll just go and approve that. So if we go back to our general ledger batch, that's now ready to post. So, because what I just wanted to show you is uh, well, a couple of other things. Um, so now that that invoice has gone through the, so we entered the invoice, it went through, was approved by the division manager through the web interface, then it was approved through by the controller for a second approval, then it went through to AP and through to GL. So now as the accounting people are now looking at the GL at the end of the month, and they see this account here offers supplies, so $357,000, which is higher than what they think. So they're not sure what that's about. So they they come and look at the transactions. And if they want to look at this one here, if they're not sure what that's for, then you can double click to open that up. And then you get the say the drill, which is standard Sage, which takes you to the AP invoice entry screen. So that's all provided as part of standard Sage, but with the Payables Workflow module, you now get an extra drill, which is this one here, which now takes you to the Payables Workflow AP Invoice Entry screen. And from there, you can go to the Workflow Documents tab and open up your PDF or JPEG or bitmap or whatever. So it's, it's, it's around about six clicks from the GL transactions and you're looking at the invoice image. Um, so most finance people say they save sort of about one to two hours a month by just having that sort of really quick access to invoice images. Um, so I guess just in terms of the payables workflow module, I guess the feedback from companies that put it in, first of all, the finance people are very positive about it. And it, it can also do, we've got a macro that can do an accrual. So it can accrue all the invoices that are still going through the approval process. So that's this macro here. So the finance users find it delivers some good benefits. The AP users really love it. And the comment that most of them say is that they feel much more in control. So instead of having paper sort of flying all around the place would, and they've got no visibility of it with this module, as soon as the invoice comes in, you enter it into the system and then you can track it. So the AP people um, um, find it much more in con yeah, beneficial. And so what we've had is one company in Auckland, um, they were doing about 2,000 invoices per month and their AP person said that they saved 50% uh, of their workload was eliminated by putting in payables workflow. Um, 
So now someone's just asked a question in the chat box, which is a good question. So saying, do you, you, you still have to manually enter the invoices? So that is very good timing because um, that's probably the next thing that I'm going to look at. So, so, so what I just showed you is entering the invoice manually and attaching the invoice image. So what that, that lets you do is get to a paperless AP environment and it lets you have electronic approval. So you've got all your audit trail is all captured in the system. So like I sort of said before, that, that company in Auckland achieved 50% say, well, 50% of their AP work was eliminated by just that feature on its own. But the next thing that is, um, I guess, quite a new service is what we call this document processing service. And this is where the software will extract the data out of the invoices and put it into Sage. So that's actually now starting to do a lot of the data capture work that the AP people are doing. So I'll show that to you quite just uh, quickly. So what we've got here is, so we call it a document processing service. So, so the invoices will arrive within this console, DPS console, five minutes after they get sent into the DPS service. Um, actually, I've got a good little, actually, no, let me just show you this and then we'll go and look at the diagram. So, so yeah, because it takes five minutes, what I want to do is just show you so what if you can just remember, so there's how many here? Two, four, six, eight, ten. So what I'll do is send one into the server so you can see it arrive within five minutes. So I need to do that now and then we can come back and look at that. So I've got an email sitting here ready. And so if we just look at this invoice really quickly, so it's it's uh, it's an invoice, so here's the invoice number, modern with today's date, 19111201, 12th of November. Um, it's one notebook, computer, two keyboards, two mice. So what I'll do is I'll send this invoice into the service. And so this is, the time here is 4.22. So at 4.27, we should see that invoice arrive within Sage. So just while we are waiting for that, we what we'll do is just have a look at this um, diagram, which shows the, um, the way this DPS service works. Right, so this is the infographic. Um, so you can see in the green hexagon on the right hand side is your Sage 300 system. So the accounts payable module that you probably all have and the purchase order module that some of you will have, maybe you all have. So that's Sage system that you have now. In the dark blue hexagon is the payables workflow module that I've already showed to you. So this is within the Sage desktop. So AP can enter the invoice into payables workflow. It goes into the approval process. The managers can do their approvals within the Sage desktop if if you want them to, or they can use PW Web, which is over on the left hand side here, to do their approvals. So we've looked at that already, but now you can up above there is our document processing service. And so when your suppliers email an invoice to you, then you can either manually or automatically have that forwarded to a mailbox that we host. And within five minutes of that, PDF getting emailed to you, within five minutes that transaction will be sitting within your Sage system ready for your AP person to review it. Um, and we always want to try and, you know, emphasise that the AP, you know, the AP person is still got an important role to play, but now they don't have to enter the data, but now they need to review the data and then they can do some other, you know, more productive jobs 
um, by the time they're not having to enter the data, they can now do some other sort of work within the organisation. All right, so hopefully that um, illustrates the way that works. So if I just can now go back to the desktop. So at 4.27, if we just click refresh, so in about two more minutes, we should see another entry come in here. But while we're waiting, we can just um, look at one of these other ones, which is very much the same. So I can just double click here. Yes, yeah, so, sorry, what I should do. I think I said it before, but just to reiterate, so this console entries just pop up in here as they're processed by the DP system. So this is really the the main screen that the AP people are sitting in. So we just come in, come into this one here, and we can see on the right hand side is the invoice that was sent in to the service, and on the left hand side is the data that the the DPS service is either it's either extracted it out of the PDF or it has derived it in some other way. And we probably don't really have time to go through all of this. Um, all of these fields now, um, and um, so, but you can see it's got the invoice number, so it's taken that out of the PDF. The date here is down the bottom, so that's out of the PDF. The um, the one seven eight five forty is sitting down the bottom, um, and then his then that's worked out the vendor, so it works out the vendor coming off from the GST number. So GST number, you set that up within Sage and that will then tell it the rate the vendor is. Now AP can change any of these fields. So what the DPS software is trying to do is, um, is do as much work and help out AP as much as it can, but AP can change anything um, at all. And so if we were happy with that, we would just hit process and I'll show you that on the next one that comes through. Um, so someone's just asked a question, can you have the supplier send the invoices straight through to the service instead of coming to, to you guys? Um, and I think it's always best for it to come to you guys because then let's say you started off utilising our service and then for whatever reason you wanted to move to another service, you want that ability yourselves. So all, all you do is you just set up an auto forward from your mailbox. So your mailbox will be ap at abc.com.au. You set up an auto forward to come through to our mailbox. So that means you guys don't need to do anything. So there's no double handling. It's just an automatic forward. Right, so now if I hit the refresh button, and yes, you can see that the, the 11th entry has popped up. So if I just double click that there, um, then you can see this is the invoice that's come in. So that's the one we looked at before. Because this is, I use this quite a lot, it's, it's got it 100% right. We always try to make sure people don't think the system's going to get it. We say, you should work on 95% accuracy. Um, just, you know, we want to make sure people are aware it's, yeah, sometimes it'll be 100%, but we don't want to promise that. So that's why we say 95%. In this case, it's 100% right. So I hit process. Um, that's now taking it to the payables workflow AP invoice entry screen, which is the one that I showed you before, where you enter it manually. You can see it's attached the documents or for the user. Now AP can still make changes here, so they can edit the GL code. Again, they can still they can change anything. Um, so again, the, the system's just tried to help them. And we hit submit, so that's now sending it into the approval process. Oh, and I'm logged in as the wrong user, um, so I could go and fix that quickly. I should be logged in as accounts payable. Now that's letting that that's pushed that through to the division manager for an approval. And now if we close that, you can now says you can now see that it says completed. So if we click refresh, that one's now gone off the list because it's showing us what's in our in tray. But if we come and look at 
uh, all statuses. You can see this one down at the bottom. So it's always there from an inquiry point of view. Um, and so I've had a few questions. Um, well, lots of questions. Uh -huh. Was this must have been the area you guys are most interested in? Um, so someone has said multiple cost centres for the same vendor would that would AP be required to amend this manually? There's a few different ways you can do that. So you can set up different configuration for each vendor. Um, so you could set up a vendor to go into a certain workflow and a certain cost centre, um, but otherwise AP can amend that as well. So it just depends how frequently, you know, if that's something that's happened, if you get 50 invoices a month, so you want to set it up automated, then there's a few ways of doing that, but if it's just one a month, maybe it's not worth setting it up and you let AP handle it. So you can do either or. Um, then the next question, does the system take into account taxable and non-taxable amounts and various codes associated with the purchases? So if they are, if it's a purchase order transaction, so if it's an invoice related to a purchase order, then it will use all of the tax set up within SAGE PO module to work out the taxes. So, and actually that's, I'm glad that one came up because I forgot to sort of touch on that. So because we're doing going through this quite quickly, I guess I'll just try to look at AP invoices just to show you how that works. But you can see here a purchase order invoice. So in this case, what the software has done, it has actually read the purchase order number out of the invoice and it has found the purchase order receipt. So we'll actually apply it against that. Um, and if I just open up this one here, you can see here it's got a purchase order number, um, so the DPS service reads that and will then look that up within the PO module within SAGE. And, but you can see here it's a little bit different because we've now got a quantity. So yeah, the whole system behaves differently. If it's an AP invoice, it behaves one way, it's just trying to pick up a GL code or it defaults the GL code from the vendor. But if it's a purchase order invoice, then it behaves quite differently. It's trying to match the invoice lines to the receipt lines. Um, so if any of you guys sort of want to look at that in more detail, then you can, um, we can show that to you. Um, and then there's another question, can you apply the emailed invoice against the outstanding purchase orders? So I think that's what I've, I've just sort of answered that one when, well, maybe I should just make sure that's clear. The invoice needs to be applied against the PO receipt. So, you know, within Sage, you have a purchase order, then you have a receipt, then you have an invoice. So the DPS system is, geared up to work on that basis. Um, we have been doing a bit of work, so we've had quite a few requests from services businesses or, and or government departments where they are wanting what you call two-way matching, so that's where the invoice is matched to the purchase order instead of to the receipt. And so we, we've, we've done quite a bit of thinking on that and we've come up with what we think is a pretty good plan for two-way matching. Um, so at the moment the DPS system doesn't support the two-way matching, it's just does doing the three-way matching. Um, but I'd say by not early next year, like January or February, we want to have this whole DPS handling the two-way matching as well. Right, and then another question was that, does the DPS module suggest which GL code or is that a default? And the answer to that is that it is a default from the vendor master file. So if we come and look up our vendor 2800, just to show you how that worked. Um, there's a couple of things, if, so this is our normal AP vendor screen, you can see here, down here is the GST number, so if my invoice, or oh, the other invoice is looking at is 987, if I just close this one, my modern one here, 
you can see his vendor number, uh, sorry, GST number 9876542222. So that's the value is sitting there. So that's how DPS knows it looks out that field there to find out who the vendor is. And then the other field that's relevant here is the this default GL code. So again, we're using the defaults that you have set up within Sage, then that's what the DPS system is using. All right, um, so I think those are some questions. I think hopefully we've covered all of those questions that you guys have had. Um, so I think just to, well, I think we've gone over time slightly by about five minutes. So um, hopefully that hasn't caused anyone too much uh, stress. <laughs> or, um, But I think we probably, well, I could keep going, but I think you guys probably have got... You've done well, Danny. I think you've covered a lot of information. Right, yes. <laughs> That's right. So we've been going through it quite quickly. Um, and it's good that you guys have had some questions, but Rob, do you want to sort of like wrap it up at this stage? You yeah, guys? Well, like this. Has anybody got anything they would just like to ask before we do close that out? Um, I think I can... Um, I mean, obviously any other question, yeah. if you guys want it, you can they see or her team and we can answer them that way. Excellent. Well, yeah, thanks for your time today then, um, Jamie. Really appreciate it. I think from the level of questions too, I think you might have some interested parties. So, um, mm, okay. Yeah, so I'll... All right. Excellent. Yeah, excellent. All right. Oh, well, thanks for, to all you guys for your time today and hopefully that was of some interest to you and yeah, we'll um, leave you to it and have a good day. Excellent, thanks. Okay, cool. Thanks, Lam. See you later. Bye.